Yo, what up? Welcome to another episode of the Oakland Warriors podcast. I'm Patrick, flying solo, and I am officially exhausted. Happy, but exhausted. The Warriors have evened up the finals, two games apiece, beating the Celtics in Boston, 107-97, regaining home court advantage, and everything feels a little bit better (laughs) right now, you know? (laughs) This game, there was a lot of angst and tension and stress and concern going into it. Basically, this game was the Warriors' season, right? They were down 2-1. If they went down 3-1, it's not totally impossible, but, you know, odds are really, really stacked against them. Although, I always think that if the Warriors are down 3-1 in the finals, it would be a poetic thing for them to actually come back from that kind of deficit and win one. This game, like if they lost it, they'd be down 3-1. But if they won it, then we're just back on course. It's two games apiece with the Warriors getting home court advantage back. You know, we're on par. So that's where we stand right now, going back to Chase Center on Monday. And... I'm just letting this feeling like soak in. I'm letting the adrenaline kind of just drain away, get reabsorbed because that was a white knuckler, (laughs) to be honest, you know? And don't get me wrong. It's not going to be smooth sailing, easy street from here on out. You got to remember these Boston Celtics, they went through two seven game series in the Eastern Conference playoffs. So they're not going to go away. And this was an amazing game. Very, very impressive performance. But like, you know, the Warriors have to get better. You know, they can still get better. They were making a bunch of mistakes and the Celtics were making them pay for them like they had done in game one and in game three. So to me, it's like they need to focus, right? Like if they're focused and they bring energy and if they can get a little bit more from Jordan Poole, from Clay Thompson and Draymond can somehow return to his old self in the friendly confines of Chase Center, that'll be huge, right? You have all the momentum right now. So with that experience, like use it. (laughs) This is now, I mean, it was the Celtics series to take, right? It was theirs. And now it's the Warriors, you know, they wrestled it back in just one game. That's how this stuff works. You know, (laughs) the absurd weirdness of seven game series. And that's what makes it so awesome. The Celtics, they came out with force and, you know, They jumped on the Warriors to start. It didn't look great. It was like, okay, well, I guess here we go. But the Warriors, they just kept fighting and fighting. And one thing that I had said that I talked to Calvin about in the last episode that I've talked to a bunch of fellow Warriors fans about lately is that the Warriors, they just didn't play with energy, with force, with immediacy, with aggression, whatever synonym you want to use in game three. And they came out with that tonight. You know, they fought and they kept fighting and fighting, fighting. And that was telling. And that's something that you wanted to see when it was halftime and the Warriors were down by five. I was like, okay, you know, like it'd be better to be up by five. And there were some chances that the Warriors let slip away in the first couple of quarters. But to me, it was like how they were playing the game. They were playing with all that energy. And I was like, if the Warriors can have some decent form of their patented third quarter explosion or run or whatever, then I liked our chances because they were playing really hard and they were very, very engaged. And I felt like they could ride that to the end and get a victory. It wasn't that simple, of course. It was a lot of up and downs, a lot of questionable stuff. It was back and forth all the way through. And even at the beginning of the fourth quarter, the Warriors were just coughing up the ball and making some dumb plays in certain sequences. And it was like, well, I guess this is how it ends right now. But You know, bottom line, like this game is the Steph Curry game, right? We came into this game wondering how his foot would feel since it got rolled on by Al Horford in game three, right? He got cleared to play, but my assumption, I'm sure a lot of people's assumption was that he would be a little bit hindered, but he wasn't. He had one of his most impressive playoff games 
definitely one of his most impressive finals games. He basically just put this Warriors team on his back. We've been saying throughout this series that the Warriors need to get something from somebody else. Clay, Jordan Poole, and, you know, neither of them had fantastic games, but they gave the Warriors that something, right? Clay was just off. He was cold for so long, but he came up big in the fourth quarter with some big shots. He hit a big three from the top, and I was like, okay, you know, that's clutch. That's clutch right there, and that's all you need. And then Jordan Poole, you know, he had 14 points, and, you know, he hit a couple of big threes early. He had eight points in the first half, I think, and those were huge when they just needed someone else to give them something, right? And also, Andrew Wiggins, man. That dude played 43 minutes, 7 for 17 only. But he had 16 boards, plus 20 on the night, 17 points. And been talking Andrew Wiggins all playoffs, and he just keeps bringing it and bringing it and bringing it. And, you know, seeing him go after it like that is huge, you know? Like, he has been their second best offensive player in this series, and he continued that. So props to Wiggins and his rebounds were huge. The Warriors needed those. He had a few big putbacks and he just was able to be that athletic guy that the Warriors don't really have for Boston to have to guard. You know, he was attacking the basket. Yeah, he got blocked a couple times, but overall, I mean, he's been their second most consistent player at both ends of the court by far in these finals. But yeah, Steph, I mean, he... I joked in the last episode about how Steph looks like he's in the 2019 finals with Quinn Cook and Alfonso McKinney instead of Clay Thompson and Jordan Poole. But, you know, like his performance in this game was impressive to me because this past season he started off really strong. And then, of course, he had like a bad shooting streak or whatever. And then he got hurt. And, you know, he's been very, very good in these playoffs. But in these finals, he has been been excellent his shot making was on display in this game and it was it was amazing because they were selling out boston was selling out on guarding him but he was hitting threes he was dribbling around people he was getting layups he was being tricky he was hitting his mid-range he was getting floaters all the stuff there was one play where he had rob williams and marcus smart on him and marcus smart bumped into him and fell down trying to get the offensive foul call didn't happen And then Rob Williams was guarding him at the three. And then all of a sudden, Steph just ran right by him and hit a simple mid-range floater in the lane. And it was like, wow, you know, I think we take for granted not just Steph's greatness, but just like his ability to hit shots from everywhere on the court. He literally put his team on his back and hit some of the biggest shots I've ever seen, which just shows you how badly he wants this. When the other championship core guys... Clay and Draymond could not bring it consistently in this game. Steph was there just to keep fighting and fighting and fighting. 41 minutes, 14 for 26, 7 for 14 from 3, 8 for 9 from the line, 10 boards, 4 assists. He did have 5 turnovers, but man, I'll overlook those because he just had to keep fighting and fighting to get his shots off and to make sure that this team was in a position to win. I mean, I am stunned. I am in awe. And I am so glad I was able to watch that game, you know? And it's not even hyperbole. That was amazing. That was literally, literally amazing. And hopefully the rest of the basketball watching world, again, got to see how great Steph is. I mean, literally, he looked like he was Steph in the playing games from the 2020-2021 season, right? Where, like, it was him And then Andrew Wiggins and then, I mean, Jordan Poole was pretty solid in the play-in games last year. But basically just Steph with some solid play from Wiggins, right? He was just hitting shots from all over. And this whole series, he's just been really, really focused. He's been the one guy out of the core three who has just been producing the whole dang time. And can't take that for granted. And it's crazy because it's like, wow, he's doing it on this stage at this level. And, you know, he he was angry. You know, he's getting some bad calls. There was that sequence where he hit two crazy threes in a row. And on the first one, Derek White came over a screen and I believe hit Steph on the hand trying to block the shot, but it wasn't called. And I was like, man, I wish Steph would you know, be a little bit more vocal about some of his foul calls 
at some point. And then subsequently he shot a three, hit it, and then got knocked over by Jason Tatum, which was a clear foul that I was like, how could you miss that? You know, I hate complaining about refs, but these refs have been woefully inconsistent and you know, it happens sometimes, but there were just some calls that were like, wait a second, Clay just got called for a foul bodying Jalen Brown when Marcus Smart did the same thing to Steph at the other end. And it wasn't just like those two instances. There were things that just kept coming up and it was like, man, it kind of sucks, you know, but it is what it is. <laughs> I appreciate the fact that there was the challenge at the end of the game where Al Horford got called for a foul on Steph going to go into the rack and I honestly thought that okay the way that these calls have been going that this was going to get overturned and you know it'd be a jump ball or whatever and it didn't so I was like okay great I guess that's the big uh makeup call <laughs> for the end of the game and you know I've said during this series I was like I don't know if the Warriors could win a war of attrition type game against these Celtics and they almost didn't but the greatness of Steph just put them over the top. It's unbelievable how he was able just to just keep this team in the game, waiting for someone else to contribute. And Clay finally did. And Wiggins hit some big shots. Are you ready for the NBA chance to be crowned? Join the finals action with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. New customers can make any $5 NBA bet and get $150 in free bets instantly. Looking to turn another small bet into a big payday during the NBA Finals? With a DraftKings Same Game Parlay, you can do just that. This NBA season, a customer placed a $5 Same Game Parlay and won over $5,000. Create your own parlay by combining multiple bets like which team will win, total made threes, total rebounds, and more, and boom, you have a shot at an even bigger payout. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now, use promo code TBPN, make any $5 bet during the NBA Finals, and get $150 in free bets instantly. That's promo code TBPN, only at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. Come on, Looney. He was huge in this game. Steve Kerr in the post-game presser even said that he should have played Looney more in game three, that that was his mistake. And it definitely was. You know, Looney he came off the bench. They started Otto Porter Jr. in this one, trying to get a little bit more offense, I suppose. But Kevon Looney played 28 minutes, three for four, 11 boards, two assists, plus 21, six points. Looney's plus 21 and Wiggins plus 20. Those were the two highest plus minuses on the night. And Steph was next at plus 11. So that just goes to show you that Wiggins and Looney have just been solid throughout this whole series and the playoffs in general. They've played their roles. They've perform their duties and everything. And, you know, I would love for these guys to win, to win a title. Draymond, you know, like Steve Kerr was doing this crazy, at the three minute mark, this crazy like offense, defense substitution thing. And I'd never seen that before in my life, not at the three minute mark. And so he was subbing in Jordan Poole on offense and subbing in Draymond for defense. And it worked. You know, it worked. And whoever thought of that, whether it was one of the assistants or whether it was Kerr himself, like that was smart. <laughs> you know, it's smart because they ended up with a win. Draymond, he was not shooting well. He just looked a little shook out there for a while. You know, it might have been because none of his quote unquote tricks or none of the things that he does well were working. I mean, you know, he's only one for seven shooting, but he had nine boards, eight assists, four steals. So it wasn't like the worst game in the world. And he did play harder and played with more force. But just on the offensive end, there were certain points in the game where he just, I mean, he got picked twice in a row, I think, or within a few possessions. And, you know, none of his shots were going in. He wasn't getting foul calls. You know, it's kind of like how Jordan Poole has been a little bit thrown off of his game where like, if he can't do this thing, then the other thing that he's, he does, like his counter, like going to the basket for Jordan Poole and then not getting foul calls, that's kind of throwing him off. And then Draymond, like not getting foul calls and not being able to hit floaters or, or just, you know, he's not the best scorer, but one for seven from him is not what you expect. He usually comes up big in big games, you know, 
he'll come up if he shot seven times usually he'll hit about four of those just because of who he is and his quote-unquote pedigree and he just steps up in big games right play off Draymond but I have no doubt that Draymond and Clay will bring it in game five at Chase Center I mean they got to right they have a second life right now Steph gave this team a second life now I mean that's the funny thing about the finals and like a seven game series like this it's like one game can just turn everything right game one turned everything this game four turned everything back so all of a sudden it's like hey the Warriors they have home court advantage again and it's as if everything is just gone the way it's supposed to and at this point there are three games left to a chase center so if the Warriors can hold on and get the next game all the pressure is on the Celtics to take game six or else it's over. You know, I think it's about a 27 series streak where the Warriors, this core during the dynasty era has won a road game in a playoff series. And this is it. You know, the streak is still alive. You know, Jeff Van Gundy at the end of the game said that Steph's performance reminded him of some of LeBron's performances when he took some of those lesser, less talented teams and just carried them on his back. And, you know, that's a that's a huge compliment. Right. And I'm sure LeBron was like, nah, (laughs) but that's that's crazy. Right. Because it's like Steph is playing with two Hall of Famers out there and he's the one he's always been the one. Right. I mean, we've known he is the best player on this team and the most critical one. But he just showed it, you know. He's the oldest out of those three dudes. Obviously, he didn't have the injuries that that Clay had, but his ability right now to just will this team to this kind of win, I mean, I'm stunned. I'm really, really, really impressed. It's crazy too because it just makes me think about how they're playing Steph, right? They're selling out on him. They got Marcus Smart on him, all this stuff. One thing I'm not seeing so much of that I recall from previous finals and previous playoff series that have really been really, really tough for the Warriors is, you know, like all the scratch marks that Steph usually gets on his arms, all the holding, all the stuff that Matthew Delvadova used to do, you know, just to be a pest. Maybe it's because Marcus Smart is just such a good defender and he's defending him well, you know, as, as well as you can, but he's such a good defender that he doesn't need to do those things or he doesn't play that kind of style. And Steph, after having been through all these battles, I mean, it doesn't look like anyone is able to really, really slow him down. You know, I was a little worried in the fourth when Steve Kerr took Steph out and (laughs) thankfully he put him back in less than three minutes into the, into the fourth, because I was like, Steph's got to play and he needs to take a ton of shots at first. When he first got back in the game in the fourth, he wasn't shooting. Jordan Poole was shooting, Clay was shooting, and they were missing. Jordan Poole was like doing a lot of dribbling and dancing and then like getting into the lane and like looking around for someone to pass to. And I was like, just just put it in in Steph's hands, please, and he will fix everything. (laughs) So as a fan, man, like this game was super, super duper intense. And I know y'all felt that too. I just don't have any more words for how amazing Steph Curry was tonight. It's been a while since I've seen a performance like that. And uh, on the biggest stage, it's on the biggest stage when your back is against the wall, when you literally don't have much help. But moving forward, right? It's like with this second life that I mentioned, it's like you had better come wreck in game five. You better lock this down. Because if you win game five, you know, not only do you have the lead, but, you know, all of a sudden this narrative is just completely just swung in the other direction. The Celtics are like, oh, yo, wait, we're overmatched or we're facing like this all time top 10, top 15 player. You also mentally you don't want to have to win another game in Boston. Yes, you want to win game five and game six, but you don't want to like lose game five. Then no that you have to win one more out there. It's it's tough. You know, it's tough. And we've seen how, you know, Draymond seems a little like, you know, shook right now for whatever reasons. I mean, I, I believe in him still, and I think he'll bring it in Oakland. Sorry, in San Francisco. So, uh, you know, go from there. Last thing I'll say is I'll bring up the keys to the series that I mentioned in the finals preview for the Warriors to have the best player, to limit their turnovers, 
and to be healthy. And for the most part, they're healthy and their turnovers. I mean, they had 16, right? Started coughing it up in the most inopportune moments that they tend to do. And the Celtics took advantage. But then we saw the Celtics as well be a team that makes a few more mistakes that gets a little shook themselves and they had 15 turnovers so those two things and then having the best player on the court and by far that was Steph my friend Aaron in Toronto sent me a text or a quote from John Hollinger about Jason Tatum that he's like top 10 but he's not elite and I think that's a good way of putting what I've been feeling about him since before the series and what I'm seeing again excellent player just amazing talent but he's not there yet in terms of being that elite guy who's just going to just completely take over. He has a few more games to prove me wrong, but, uh, you know, we'll see. Anyway, that's all I got for now. I'm going to relax, and then game five on Monday is going to be huge. I'm feeling pretty good right now, and I hope uh, you all are too. Anyway, enjoy your weekend, Warriors fans. Y'all deserve it. It's been a rough, <laughs> rough week. That's another episode of the Oakland Warriors podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Feel free to hit me up on Twitter at Patrick Lupino or at Oakland Warriors. Check us out at OaklandWarriors.com and be sure to check out our YouTube channel, YouTube.com slash Oakland Warriors. Also check us out at OaklandWarriors.com and be sure to tell your fellow Warrior fan friends to tune in and listen to the Oakland Warriors podcast. It's produced by National Film Society and is a part of the Basketball Podcast Network. And if you're so inclined, please do leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and or Spotify and leave us a nice review on Apple Podcasts. That would be hugely helpful. Thanks for listening. That's it. Music in this episode provided by Paper Sun. Special thanks to Paul Amardo for production support. See you next time.